Well, good morning. Good to see you all. You can join me in opening your Bibles to the book of Leviticus. And let's pray and ask the Lord's help this morning. Our Father, we thank you for your faithful and true word. And we, uh, many of us, uh, have experienced its power in our lives. Um, so thank you for giving us your truth. Thank you for giving us your spirit so that we can understand it. We pray that you would open our eyes to see the beauty of Jesus and life in him through the book of Leviticus. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, imagine for a moment that your favorite actor or athlete or musician moved into your neighborhood and you got connected with this person and this person wanted to be your friend. They invited you into their life, they extended an invitation for you to join them at an upcoming gathering at their house. They, they were extending invitations for you to spend time with their family and friends. You're welcome anytime they've said they sincerely want to be your friend. You're invited in. But then in the coming months, you never go. You wave a couple times as you see them. You sometimes are at home watching clips of interviews um, of them as an actor, athlete, or musician online, but you never actually connect with them personally. So that reminds me of something that happened to me in high school. A uh, singer and rapper named Nelly launched his career and became famous. I lived in the St. Louis area where he was from, and he bought a house in my neighborhood. And my friend and I met him and talked with him. A few weeks later, we dropped him off a gift with a note with my phone number offering to hang out and show him around because he didn't know anyone in town. And then a few weeks later, um, a call came through my phone three times in a row, and I screened it. I had forgotten that I gave him my number. And so here's the deal. This was right when cell phones came out, and my phone did not have caller ID, and it didn't have voicemail set up, so couldn't call this person back couldn't leave a voicemail. The caller clearly tried three times to reach me and then gave up and never tried again. Um, but the thing is, only three people had my number. My mom, the friend I was with at the time, and the friends whose house I was going to. So my friend wasn't calling me. I asked my friend when I was going to his house, did you just call me? No. I asked my mom later. She didn't try calling me. And then I realized, oh no, I think Nellie's trying to be my friend. Um, so I am, I can only be about 95% sure that it was him. Christina thinks 95% is probably generous. Um, I'll never know. So this is as close as I've been to having anyone famous want to be my friend. Um, and I'm still not really sure about it. But back to the scenario in your mind. What if your favorite athlete or actor or musician moved into your neighborhood and wanted to be your friend? But you screened their calls. You kept your distance other than an occasional wave. I wonder how many of us realize that we may often treat God this way. He has come into this world in Jesus Christ and sent his spirit to befriend us. And he has opened his doors wide for friendship with him. He welcomes us anytime through the cross of Jesus. And do we often just neglect him, ignore him. In fact, one of the ways that he wants us to think about what he offers us is a feast, a meal in his presence to celebrate and enjoy the fullness of life. This is actually what Leviticus 1 through 3 is ultimately all about. God is coming to Israel here to invite them into friendship with him. He has moved his home in their neighborhood and invited them in. People often view this section, these first three chapters and beyond, as stale, filled with boring rules, but this actually holds out a beautiful vision of the good life, but it's doing so mainly through um, you know, minimally explained, symbol-laden rituals. So this is hard for us. Many modern people don't appreciate rituals. 
But we actually do appreciate some of them, if you think about it. We actually still establish rituals around the things that are most important in life. Weddings are the most obvious. Funerals, events like birthdays and Thanksgiving, we create rituals around life and death and close relationships. In our home, we have a ritual that we call um, Friday Family Feast and Fun Night, uh, because I like alliteration, just not for sermon points. So, (laughs) we do this at home. We light a candle. We often have pizza, fun food, and drinks. We share highs and lows of the week to thank, thank God. We watch a movie. Rituals express values. We create rhythms and rituals around the things that we view as most sacred and important in life. In Leviticus 1 through 3, God is giving Israel rituals to express what it means to be restored to Him. These are all about being accepted by God and giving to God and enjoying a feast in His presence. They symbolically portray the wonder of being restored to the life we were actually made for. They echo the lost joys of Eden, and they cultivate hope in the new creation to come. So here's the main point of Leviticus 1 through 3, and then we'll read parts of it. God is inviting Israel to draw near to Him and enjoy Him through three symbol-laden offerings. These offerings show how to participate in God's restored relationships with them. They picture the realities of acceptance by God, giving to God, and feasting with God. So, we'll read the first part of each offering, and the first part of each of these first three chapters in Leviticus. Leviticus begins this way, the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering, from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting, that he may be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Then he shall kill the bull before the Lord. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall bring the blood and throw the blood against the sides of the altar that is at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Then he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall put fire on the altar and arrange the wood on the fire. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall arrange the pieces, the head and the fat, on the wood that's on the fire on the altar. But its entrails and its legs he shall wash with water. And the priests shall burn all of it on the altar as a burnt offering, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord." Then he goes on to repeat this with some variation if the offering is from the flock or from the birds. And then chapter 2 begins this way, when anyone brings a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour. He shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it and bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests. And he shall take from it a handful of the fine flour and oil with all of its frankincense, and the priest shall burn this as its memorial portion on the altar a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. And then he continues with various variations if you offer this in a baked um, manner or cooked on a griddle or in a pan. And then chapter 3 gives the third offering. If his offering is a sacrifice of peace offering... If he offers an animal from the herd, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord, and he shall lay his hand on the head of his offering and kill it at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall throw the blood against the sides of the altar, and from the sacrifice of the peace offering, as a food offering to the Lord, he shall offer the fat covering the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails, and the two kidneys with the fat that is on them at the loins and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys. Then Aaron's sons shall burn it on the altar on top of the burnt offering, which is on the wood on the fire. It is a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And then he goes on with variation if it's from the flock as a sheep or a goat. 
So these three offerings, but they are not just archaic rituals with arbitrary rules. These are symbol-laden offerings, and they show Israel how they're invited to participate into a restored relationship with God. God moved into the neighborhood. He's opening His life into friendship with them, and these offerings express how they can draw near to God, and they point forward to the realities that Jesus Christ has now brought to His people. So, these are symbolic pictures of the realities to come in the new creation that Jesus has now already brought into history with us. So, all through this Leviticus series, we'll be doing three steps. What's Leviticus say? Then how does it connect to Jesus? And then how does it connect to us? All three are important. Don't just stay in Leviticus. You don't just stay into Leviticus and then connect it straight to us. You go to Jesus and then to us. This is how it works in the Bible. So, Leviticus actually opens up with instructions of five offerings. We looked at the first three. They give different aspects of what it means to draw near to God. This morning, we're looking at the first three, and these are intentionally grouped together. And it seems they actually have an intentional progression to them that we'll see. So, in order to see this, though, we have to start by understanding them in light of two key contexts. So, the first context is the Exodus. God has just rescued Israel from slavery in Egypt. He's brought them to Mount Sinai, where He's met with Moses and then the people, and He gave instructions for building this tent, this tabernacle. And the tabernacle was a tent that would allow Israel to take God's special presence with them on their journey to their new land. And at the end of Exodus, God's glory filled the tabernacle, but there was a problem because Moses couldn't go in, the people couldn't go in. How can Moses or anyone else get in then to meet with God? Leviticus is the answer, and it starts with these offerings. So, these offerings are how God's people begin to draw near to God's presence. By chapter 9, we see these offerings set up along with the priesthood, and Moses can then go in with the priest. So, these are part of the answer. There's a broader context, though, not just the Exodus, but also Eden. Leviticus isn't just part of Israel's story. It's part of humanity's story. It's part of your story. The story began in Eden with humanity enjoying God's presence. So, a Hebrew word that we use to describe what Eden was like is shalom. It refers to peace or wholeness. It refers to this joyful communal flourishing that was in Eden. But now Adam and Eve sinned, and they're sent out of Eden. And so, this world of shalom is shattered. We're now all born outside of Eden, away from God, into this life of sin and suffering that we're experiencing, but God is going to restore us to this. And this is what the tabernacle is all about. The tabernacle is a symbolic Eden. That's what we spent last week considering. It's filled with imagery from Eden, the the curtains, the furniture, everything about it, the rituals. And so, we have to keep this in mind in every part of Leviticus. When Israel is shut out of the tabernacle, We should be picturing in our mind Adam and Eve shut out of Eden. And when God invites people to draw near to Him, to the tabernacle, it's a a symbolic picture of coming back to God's Edenic presence. And it points forward to the day when God will make a new creation, the new and better Eden, where He will dwell with His people. So, we have to keep this in mind. So, here's the question Leviticus answers then. Not just how can Moses get into the tabernacle, how can Israel draw near to the tabernacle, but more broadly, how can the sinful sons and daughters of Adam and Eve get back to Eden? How can we get back to God and this wonder world that He made? How how will God restore the life we lost in Eden and even make it better? Well, Leviticus gives the answer, but in a temporary and symbol-laden way. So, Leviticus is the way that Israel and its priests will enter and enjoy God's holy presence. And this symbolically points forward to how Jesus will one day bring us into our true home in the new creation. And so, we will be invited in all because of Jesus, and this restoration, this coming into God's presence has already begun 
through Jesus and by His Spirit. So, Leviticus is written to foreshadow and cultivate hope in the new creation and enjoy this reality that Jesus has now already brought. So, these offerings that we're looking at here are symbol-laden rituals that show us how God is renewing and restoring the life we lost in Eden. And the three offerings we'll see today teach three aspects of what it means to be restored to God. It taught Israel three aspects of this in this temporary symbol-laden way, and it teaches us three essential aspects of what it means to be restored to God. Do you want to know God? Do you want to draw near to His presence? Do you want to live the life you were made for? The three first chapters of Leviticus show you how, believe it or not. They teach us about acceptance by God, giving to God, and feasting with God. So let's look at each of these. So the first offering teaches us about acceptance by God. Now this is most often called the burnt offering because the whole animal is placed on the altar in the courtyard right in front of the tabernacle. The whole animal is burned up. So it's sometimes called the whole burnt offering. Sometimes it's called the ascension offering. And that's because the Hebrew word to, used to refer to this is actually not the word most often used for burnt, but actually means ascending. So the picture is the animal is transformed into smoke that ascends to God's presence. So it's the ascension offering or the whole burnt offering. And let's walk through the process here. So first, the person would bring the offering. So you bring an animal to the courtyard of the tabernacle. So this is right outside the tent, which has the holy place and the most holy place in it, God's presence. And this is verse 3. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting, that he may be accepted before the Lord. So notice the animal here is without blemish. This highlights that the animal is a substitute for this sinner. You are morally blemished. But an unblemished animal can represent you before God. This also ensures that the offering was costly. A blameless animal would be worth more to you. So this would be a financial sacrifice to you to see this burned up completely before you. And there's a detail here that shows the kind heart of God. Do you see that there are three paragraphs here in chapter 1, beginning in verse 3? One is for an animal of the herd. So this is verse 3. If you bring an animal from the herd, here's what you do. And then the second is from the flock. This is verse 10. If his gift for a burnt offering is from the flock, from sheep or goats, he shall bring a male without blemish. And then the third paragraph is from the birds. This is verse 14. If it's from the birds, then he shall bring an offering of turtle doves or pigeons. What's going on there? Why the flexibility? Why the options? Well, it's not actually explained right here which is why it's sometimes hard to read this and understand what's going on. But later in Leviticus, we learn that this is a provision for the poor. Many people couldn't afford to bring a bull in, so they could bring a sheep or a goat. Well, some people can't afford that, so they can bring a bird. So he's, you see God's kindness here and what this means? Acceptance before God is open to anybody. This is not going to be just for the wealthy. If you can't afford a bull, you can bring a bird. Anybody can get in on this. You see this God's kind-hearted care for the poor on page 1 of Leviticus, and it's all throughout the book. And then you bring it into the courtyard of the tabernacle, emphasizing that this is the direction of returning to God's presence. So you as humanity have been kicked out of Eden, and now you come to this symbolic Eden with God's special presence. You come to the entrance and you bring this offering. And then you press your hand down on the head of this animal. This is verse 4. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering. The word for lay is more like lean. It's not just a gentle touch. You take your bull or your animal and you press down on its head. It's a way of identifying yourself with it. You're saying, this animal is going to represent me. It's your substitute. It also could picture as later in Leviticus, transferring your sins to this animal. And then you kill it. And when I say you kill it, I mean you as the normal Israelite who brought this are the one who kills this animal. You don't get to just kind of drop off this sacrifice for the priest to take care of. 
you have to slit its throat. That's probably how it was done. And the priest would catch the blood in some kind of container and then sprinkle it or throw it on the sides of the altar, a picture of cleansing. And then after you cut it up and place its pieces on the altar, the whole animal is burned. And the emphasis is on how it's transformed into smoke that rises up to the presence of God. It may be a picture of the person represented by the animal ascending in that smoke, with that smoke, to God's presence. The sinner can't go into God's presence, but the blameless animal can, transformed into smoke that rises and ascends. So, what is this about? Well, this burnt offering, this ascension offering, is really the foundational offering. It's first for a reason here, and it's multifaceted. It's used in a number of different ways throughout the Old Testament to express to God a number of things. So, here's three that seem like these are three of the primary ways that this offering was used. First, it was about drawing near. So, the person brings an animal as a way of drawing near to God. Remember what happens to the animal here. This animal, blameless animal, representing the person is transformed into smoke and ascends to God's presence, perhaps symbolizing even the person drawing near symbolically through this animal. Second, it's about devotion. This sacrifice was costly, totally burned up, a total financial loss. It's a way of saying to God, I'm giving my whole self to you. I honor you. I'm devoted to you. And third, it's about acceptance. It's an atoning sacrifice, it says, which is about cleansing and forgiveness. When the person offers a sacrifice, that animal dies in the place of that sinner, right? Saying, if you were to enter God's presence, you would die because you've sinned and rejected this God, and you deserve death. But this animal will stand in your place and die in your place. So to offer this, Just picture this Israelite worshiper wanting to come to draw near to God. Here's God's Edenic presence with them. And they bring this animal at great cost to themselves. And they walk it to the entrance of God's presence. And with the help of the priests, they're offering this. And they're saying to God, I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to be here. But I'm bringing you this animal without blemish. It's going to stand in my place. I'm leaning my hand on this animal, making that clear. And then this animal, in a sobering moment, dies in my place, so I don't have to. And I'm giving myself to you. I'm drawing near to you. I'm showing I'm devoted to you. And thank you that you accept me because of this. So this is the foundational offering for Israel. It's the priests actually offer this in the morning of every day kind of a reset, right? This is how we start our day in Israel with the burnt offering for the priests and the people. And then very often, if you had another offering you wanted to do, you offered the burnt offering first and then anything else was on top of it. This is the foundation. And can you see how this intentionally foreshadows Jesus? There are a number of places in the New Testament that portray Jesus as a burnt offering or an ascension offering. He's the blameless lamb presented to the Father on our behalf. We're invited to, you know, press our hands on His head on the cross by faith, identifying Him as our substitute who dies in our place so we don't have to. And on the cross, His side is pierced and His lifeblood drains. And then He rose and ascended to the Father, and through Him we ascend to God's presence. The second offering is about giving to God. So, the progression here, now that we're accepted by God and demonstrating our devotion to Him, we give to Him. This is typically called the grain offering. It's in chapter 2 here because it involves grain. But the Hebrew word often refers to not grain, but a gift or tribute that's given to a king. And so, this offering really is about a gift. So, you can just write in your, in your notes or if you're a Bible writer, yes, grain offering, but just like, this is a gift offering. This is a tribute offering to God. So here's the process, verse 1, when anyone brings a grain or a gift offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour, so the best stuff here, and he shall pour, pour oil on it and put frankincense on it and bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, 
And he shall take from it a handful of the fine flour and oil with all of its frankincense. And the priest shall burn this as its memorial portion on the altar, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. And then this goes on to give some variations here. If you bring grain that's baked in the oven or cooked on a griddle or in a pan. And the process then is to bring the grain, mix it with oil, or put oil on it, and then you burn part of it on the altar. And it's referred to here as a memorial portion, probably referring to God remembering us and His promises to us. So the offer burns a handful of this or burns part of it as a memorial offering saying, God, remember me. Remember your faithful promises to me. And so God is faithful to His covenant promises to us, and it's a way of saying, I'm faithful to you. There's a repeated emphasis on making sure you add salt. It's repeated throughout this chapter. It's called the salt of the covenant. Salt is sometimes associated with ideas of permanence or endurance. So to add salt was a way of saying, our faithfulness to one another is enduring. You remember your promises to me. I remember to be faithful to you. It's most likely what this refers to. Salt's also used in meal context as a way of expressing friendship and fellowship. So a small portion is burned, and then the rest of it is given to the priests. So this was very practical. This was a primary way that Israel supported the priests' work. So the priests were devoting their lives to serving God and His people, and then the people supported them by giving to them. Okay, so what does this have to do with us today? Well, we no longer burn grain and give grain to leaders, but this offering is not completely gone. It's fulfilled through Jesus. So now we respond to God's grace and acceptance of us by giving our whole self to God. We recognize everything we have is His, and we offer ourselves up to Him. Romans 12.1 says this, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. So in view of God's acceptance, and this is Romans 12, so previously in Romans, Jesus being the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, in view of all of this, now what do you do? You present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You give your whole self to Him. And the principle of compensating the priests for their work is actually still fulfilled in a very practical way in compensating leaders for their work. Jesus and Paul both make a parallel to church leaders today. Paul quotes actually Leviticus 2 in 1 Corinthians 9 to refer to how pastors should be financially supported. So church leaders are supported so they can be freed up to devote themselves to serving God and His people and its witness. So as you experience acceptance through Jesus' sacrifice, through His work in His death and resurrection, you now give your whole life to Him. You honor Him with your finances. And this is why we give to the local church in particular and make local church giving a priority to supporting the ministry and the mission of the local church that Jesus has established here. So it largely, your giving to Zionsville Fellowship, for instance, is largely going to support the leaders and mission partners and for our ministry and mission here. So, thank you for the grain. The third offering is where everything's headed. And this is the end and the goal of the first two. Chapter 3 is the peace offering, and it's about feasting with God. This is sometimes called... Uh, the fellowship offering. The word is related to the Hebrew word shalom, which I mentioned earlier means peace. And this Hebrew concept of shalom is about comprehensive peace. The ultimate vision here is the restoration of Eden, where there's peace with God and peace together with one another. Eden was the place where there was communal joy and flourishing in, in all of life. And that's what this offering is about. It's picturing in a symbol-laden way in a very minimally explained way here, uh, but it's picturing how God restores the lost shalom of Eden. This offering is here to cultivate hope in the day when Jesus will restore all things and make all things new. 
So here's how the offering pictures it. God is the king of Israel. The tabernacle, in, in some ways, is viewed as his palace and the most holy place, his throne room. And he's inviting people to bring a meal to his presence, and they will eat it together with him. It'll be a royal feast with God. The process is very similar to the burnt offering that we saw in chapter 1. So the person brings an animal to the courtyard, right, in front of God's presence, and then they would press their hand on the head to identify with this animal, and then they would kill it. Blood would be thrown on the altar again, but this time, the whole animal's not burnt. Only certain parts. It's verses 3 and 4. You can read it again with me. And from the sacrifice of the peace offering, as a food offering to the Lord, he shall offer the fat covering the entrails and all the fat that is on the entrails and the two kidneys with the fat that's on them at the loins and the long lobe of the liver that he shall remove with the kidneys. Now, it could sound to some of us like it's like, oh, yeah, I mean, giving God the worst. I mean, that doesn't sound good to most of us. But actually, this would have sounded like the best parts back then. These were the best parts, the most special parts, the fat parts, and some of these uh, other things mentioned here. A friend of mine, Joe, loves the fat parts. We were on staff together at my previous church, and sometimes we'd come in and bring our lunches and just eat them around the table, so we bring leftovers. And he was bringing leftover steak, and he had just, I mean, it was like a foot long of this strip of just like all the fat, everything together. I know some of you love this. He loved it, and he just kind of held it out, and, you know, he just lets it come, go down. I'll never forget the moment. So even to this day, you know, right before I just scrape all that stuff into the trash, I text him a picture, you know, because I think <laughs> he would enjoy that. So this is the good stuff. The fat is the Lord's, it says later. And then some of this would be given, some of the food would be given to the priests, again, to care for the leaders of God's people. But most of it was eaten by the person offering it, along with family and guests, friends. And this was a ton of meat. And this would have been a luxury to eat meat in Israel like this. This was a very special occasion. It was a joyful celebration. It was a party. And the tone is expressed in Deuteronomy 12, 7. So here's referring to this fellowship offering. Deuteronomy 12, 7 puts it this way. You shall eat before the Lord your God. Remember, this is outside of the tabernacle, toward the tabernacle in His presence. You shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your households, in all that you undertake, in which the Lord your God has blessed you. So they would eat a feast together with their family and friends, likely inviting those who couldn't afford this kind of thing as well to be participating here. And the Lord Himself is commanding them to rejoice, sit back, relax, enjoy a feast in my presence. And this was not just a meal between friends and family. It was viewed as a meal with God in His presence. Offering the fat was a symbolic way of serving God the best part, not like He eats food. I mean, this is symbolic, but it's a way of offering that to God because God is saying, I have a plate here too because I'm restored in fellowship with you. This is a meal together. You're eating it in my presence and I'm with you. So this offering, this joyful feast with God, this is a major theme from beginning to end in the Bible. It's at the heart of what human history is all about. When covenants were made, they were consummated with a meal. We still do this today, wedding receptions. Right, a covenant's made, and we have a feast together. And there's two moments that help us understand just how important this was. So let's think again about those two contexts, Exodus and Eden. So the first moment uh, that I want to refer to here is the one that just happened for them in Exodus. So Israel came to Mount Sinai, and remember, as they're hearing this from Leviticus for the first time here, God is giving this to Moses while they're still at Sinai. The tabernacle instructions were given at Sinai, the tabernacles set up at Sinai, and then God speaks about these offerings still at Sinai. Just before this, while they were at Sinai, God made a covenant with them. And in Exodus 24, verse 5, they offered burnt offerings, 
It's Leviticus 1, and fellowship offerings. Leviticus 3. And then when the fellowship offering was eaten, the elders of Israel, right, they climb halfway up the mountain, right, moving closer to God's presence, like entering further into the tabernacle. And then we read this in Exodus 24.10. And they saw the God of Israel up on Mount Sinai. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel because they were sacrifice. They beheld God and ate and drank, likely eating the fellowship offerings that were just given. It was a royal feast in the presence of our king. And now in Leviticus, still at Mount Sinai, God is saying to them, this feast can continue whenever you want. Bring in the animal. Bring whoever you want. Sacrifice this. Give me the best parts. The priests get in on this. And then have, have a feast. Rejoice for all the goodness that I've given you. Let's celebrate in my presence. So that's one background here. The other background is Eden. In Eden, God was viewed as the king, and he spread a feast before humanity, gave them trees with anything they wanted there, and his command to them was go eat from any tree except one. The idea is that they could have a feast with God's presence in the garden, feasting in his presence. And so the fellowship offering is a way of reenacting the fellowship of Eden. At Sinai, when the elders went up and beheld God and ate and drank, it was a, an Edenic kind of moment, an echo of Eden, a longing for where history is heading. And so they can, now Israel can gather together and have a feast in God's presence. So how does Jesus fulfill this? Well, the night before he died, he had a meal with his disciples, and that meal pointed forward to his death. It was a fellowship offering. The death of Jesus is what makes peace with God and peace with one another possible. It restores the lost fellowship we had in Eden. And so we now celebrate the Lord's Supper, which we'll do next Sunday, recognizing that this is a fellowship meal. Jesus has given his life for us, and now he's spread a feast before us in his presence so that we can enjoy the lost fellowship from Eden. We can have this recovered through Jesus and then celebrate in his presence. That's why the tone of the meal is both serious and joyful. It's serious because Jesus died to purchase it. We don't deserve to have a place at God's table, but it should also be joyful because this is God giving us back the shalom we lost in Eden. It's a celebration meal. And you know, there's another sense in which all the meals that Christians eat together can be expressions of this peace offering. Jesus has restored the lost shalom in Eden, and so we eat together in His presence, recognizing that, that this is part of the restoration that God's given us as we celebrate together. That's why in the book of Acts, Christians are always eating together, constantly eating together. So have feasts for one another. Sit back, relax, thank God for being here, there with you, and celebrate this together. So this is God's word to us through the first three offerings in Leviticus. He is the creator and the king. He's moved into the neighborhood, and he's inviting people to come to him, to find acceptance as sinners, to give as expressions of thankfulness for all that he's given us, and then to enjoy and celebrate a feast in his presence, to honor him for all that he restores to us. So yes, these rituals in Leviticus have a lot of rules, but we build uh, rituals around the most important events in life, weddings, funerals, holidays, and the rules actually here are not overly complicated when you get used to it. A lot of you, uh, if you were to explain people how to go through your typical work day or do a process that you have, you, you'd write down a lot of specific rules, and someone may think it sounds overwhelming, but it's actually not that complicated. The priest would get this no problem. So it's actually not that hard to understand, and it's really just the rules to regulate and express how they come into his presence to enjoy him. And we don't do these anymore, but not because we just don't care or because they were overly complicated, but because they were always meant to be temporary and symbolic pointers to Jesus and our life with him. So we don't disregard these, we fulfill them. So a couple questions to wrap up our time here. Three sets for each, one, one for each offering here. First, are you coming 
to God through the Lord Jesus as your burnt offering? Have you come to Him? If you've not, you can. You draw near to Him through faith and prayer and ask Him to forgive you. Say, Lord Jesus, I don't, Father, I don't belong to be here, but the Lord Jesus died for me as my offering, and so I'm drawing near to you through Him. Please cleanse me, forgive me, receive me. Have you by faith pressed your hand on His head to transfer your sins to Him? Has He therefore died in your place so that you are accepted as righteous in God's sight? Are you drawing near to the Father through prayer? This offering, the burnt offering, was not to be just a one-time offering. This is a repeated offering, a recognition of our need before God. Do you regularly recognize that you are always needing to be under the grace of Jesus? Second, are you giving your gifts to Christ as a fulfillment of the gift offering? Do you view all your money as God's, given to you to be a steward of, and then part of which you're called to give explicitly to the work of gospel ministry? Are you responding by giving back to Him and blessing other people and supporting the local church? Are you spending money wisely for the advance of the mission of Christ? And then third, are you enjoying the peace and fellowship that God's given you through Jesus? Do you realize that Jesus did not die for you just to forgive you but to befriend you so that you could enjoy His presence like around a feast. So are you enjoying fellowship with God? Or do you mainly view God as distant and as a burden? When you read His Word, and if you don't do it regularly, engage with Him in His Word, but don't do it as a burden, recognize this is, this is God inviting you to hear from Him and then respond in prayer, in fellowship. And then do you spend time with God's people eating and enjoying a feast together? So in all of this, are you looking forward to the fulfillment of all of this which is yet to come? The full fulfillment in the new creation. One day Jesus is going to return. He's going to make everything new. It'll be eaten again, but better. And we'll be accepted by Him. We'll give our whole self to Him. And we'll enjoy a feast in His presence. Let me end by reading from Isaiah 25, uh, which one of my favorite texts in the Bible, it gives a picture of this fulfillment that's yet to come. And Isaiah 25 uh, is actually in very clearly echoing both Eden and Exodus 24 with this feast in God's presence and the fellowship offerings. It says this in Isaiah 25, 6, on this mountain, Mount Zion, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples, right? This is not just for Israel now, all peoples, a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine. Wine would be added to the fellowship offerings once they got into the land. Of rich food, full of marrow. Of aged wine, well-refined. And he, God, will swallow up on this mountain the covering that's cast over all peoples. The veil that's spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces in the reproach of his people, he'll take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, in this day of the great feast, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. So let's be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you through Jesus, and we're so thankful that you've written history to end and culminate in this forever feast. And we thank you for teaching us about this through Leviticus and bringing to its, it, to its fulfillment through Jesus. We thank you for the fellowship you've given us through him and that we have with one another. We pray that you would help us enter more closely into fellowship with you and more deeply into enjoyment with all your good gifts you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can stand up.